welcome to Quant Minds. I'm joined today by Carol Alexander from the University of Sussex. Carol, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for asking me, Lily. So tell me about yourself and your work in crypto assets. Okay, so I've been increasingly specialising in crypto over the last five years. I picked it up as a new topic when I felt like a change. I started writing some papers on crypto uh, around 2018 or so. And then one thing led to another. And now I would say about 45% of my work, I'm just doing some real math stuff still, but keep my brain alive because it's not very quant the work I do in crypto, although the forensic work that, you know, forensic finance going into the microstructure, you need such massive data sets. Of course, I don't do any of that now. I work with um, colleagues that, that do that. But yeah, no, it's getting um, so interesting because it is so important and so few people understand it. You do though. I mean, your questions were really, really <laughs> good. I thought, how have they got these questions? They're perfect. I don't have to change anything. So normally when I get questions, I edit them. Well, thank you so much for saying that. I did actually want to talk to you about the market though. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I feel like I feel like this is a very unique market in its mm. in its own. It's got its own volatility. It's got its own mind by mm. the looks of things. It's so being what, manipulated. So what are the key trends here? Trends are um, being driven by increasing institutional interest. We've got the BlackRock ETF. Of course, of course BlackRock is also managing the um, Circle. That's the second major stablecoin. Um, managing that fund. Access to the overnight repo facility. My God, you know, US governments are now using crypto as yet another source because cash and banks aren't enough to finance the debt. Uh, so institutions, anyway, um, are getting increasingly into all major banks now have got um, digital asset sides. They, and I will, you know, because they're good at risk management, hopefully they'll bring some risk management into crypto, which is we really, really need. Um, and that, of course, also is building consumer confidence. On the other hand, we've got regulation and Gary Gensler, um, also the CFTC, Department of Justice are bringing so many well-deserved cases in some cases, not necessarily Gary Gensler's vendetta against Ripple, which we've just heard is not a security, which is great because it isn't. And then the crazy judgment that Ether, the currency of the Ethereum blockchain and everything that goes on it is security. Is yeah. Ether is, anyway, I'm going off topic. The two main trends are institutional interest, driving growth, more demand, and regulation, which is a bit of a joker in the pack. Um, and of course, things like the collapse of FTX um, goes hand in hand with the regulatory side because it catalyzes uh, more, more regulation. Uh, but laid on top of those opposing trends for the Bitcoin price, which drives everything, um, is the manipulation, um, mainly on Binance, Bitcoin Tether Perpetual, or Bitcoin USD Perpetual as well. They have two perpetuals. These contracts, very, very close to the spot. And um, quite a bit of my research focuses on earlier research, not now. Um, the, the impact that Binance has on destabilizing the entire market. <clears throat> so what happens is you get a bit of good news, like Ripple. Professional traders, um, Binance itself, Jump, Jane, Cumberland, big hedge funds, big major banks. Uh, obviously, they don't do it overtly, um, but they do do it's, it. And they put on very, very large trades, much more than the normal size that would be banned in a regulated market. Of course, nothing is regulated on Binance. And then they'll sort of fire the cannon upwards as soon as there's a bit of good news and they'll massive trades, put the price usually up about 4%, and then they sell. Just as investors think, oh my God, we must get into it, ordinary investors. And then they buy the top and it comes down again because the whales are selling. And then some bad news, um, for example, you know, the news about SEC um, uh, going after Binance. You would have expected the opposite. Cannons turn around 180 degrees, fire in the other directions, big shorts put on, and then they buy the bottom. However, since Binance is one of these players that are doing it, you know, maybe they were counterbalancing those trades. And we didn't see that, but 
if it's n not bad news about finance, but bad news about something else, they will succeed in shooting the price down 4% approximately. Then they buy back. Uh, well, just when investors are thinking, OK, well, I should short the market is tumbling uh, and then the price recovers. So ordinary investors are screwed either way. Hmm. This market is not for ordinary people. No, it feels very, very specific. And it feels so, so sensitive to so many things as well. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about the, the impact that consumer sentiment or like social media posts mm. might have an impact on. How do you see that? Well, that's what I was just explaining, really, yeah. is, is that there's a bit of news and then professional traders get in very quickly and profit from that news. So there was so much confusion about is Bitcoin blockchain and, you know, and now we've got this same confusion. Is crypto DeFi or, you know, how is it related? That's a really good question. So DeFi is much, much bigger than crypto. Absolutely. DeFi is really everything blockchain. And you do need crypto to run blockchains. You need something called the native token to put smart contracts on blockchains. So Ether is the native token of Ethereum. Bitcoin is the native token of the capital B for blockchain, little b for Bitcoin, uh, the coin or the native token. Mm. But you see, you can't really do anything on the Bitcoin blockchain itself because it's just a clunky old stupid proof of work thing. There are what we call layer two solutions that allow you to put smart contracts on Bitcoin, the Omni layer and various others. So you can use Bitcoin to like the fuel for those smart contracts, but it's not primary use of Bitcoin. Bitcoin blockchain is useless. It's just a toy. The Ethereum blockchain and all the what we call layer two other sort of speeding up solutions and you know, a huge architecture now underpins the entire digital economy. And where there are private blockchains, they're also using Ethereum standards. Now, private blockchains don't need a coin to run because the consensus can be done just by people who are employed by, usually it's a consortium, like a consortium of banks will run their like a quarter blockchain or something like that. Um, and so it's people, people's job is validation. So, but of, of, of the different transactions. And already we're seeing finance, you know, interest rate swaps, bonds and, and, and so forth. And now the just um, just a few days ago, the HM Treasury put out a call to say we are stopping all trading of sh paper shares. It's everything's going to be digital assets based. So, in fact, I'm very well posed at that point because I'm working on a project exactly for that to tokenize stocks. And so I'll be going to talk to the Treasury about that as soon as I can. Um, anyway, so DeFi is like this massive iceberg. On the one hand, you've got the computer science revolution. It's much, much more than just AI. AI is actually straightforward. The technology we're using for AI has been around for decades, but the technology we are developing for blockchains is amazing. And there's the young generation who are surprisingly slightly disillusioned by the way the Western capitalism has denied them, you know, the sort of things that I had when I was your age. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, money. <laughs> Inequality is growing all the time. And so you find, because there are no boundaries, people in India, other more developing countries and so forth, pioneering the architecture here. And the solutions they come up with, because they're not, they haven't grown up in financial markets, they make their own. So that's why we see all these innovative products, staking services, or you don't get that anywhere else. Even some of their financial products, like variable leverage tokens, they don't exist in ordinary markets. The perpetuals, the, the main thing that's traded, they don't exist in ordinary markets too. But beyond the financial markets, we've got the whole economy. Supply chains are running on blockchain now. And so, you know, this is all DeFi in a much broader sense, because of course you need finance for blockchains and it's the finance, the certificates, the port authorities and things like that that are being tracked or insurance claims. So, but then blockchain is also underpinning, underpinning not just the financial part of the economy, but things like health services and so forth. It's you know, broader than finance. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> no, not a problem. 
Yeah, no, I, I feel like um, I feel like whenever it's happening in the crypto space, it feels like it will reflect on the DeFi space because, as you say, people may not be able to tell it apart. So whatever sort of um, stories that come out of it might still impact the future of the DeFi it space. It will. It will. I mean, if finance goes under, then that's going to be quite a huge knock on crypto central. But I mean, we do we can't not have native tokens like Ether um, and there are many, many other blockchains as well, po Polygon and, and Solana. And I mean, some of these are taking a hit. We, we don't need as many as we, we've got. And so now we need things called layer zeros that sort of intersect all these motorways together and connect them, you know, and, you, but, and they all carry smart contracts. Um, but then there are this other form of token, which is crowdfunding. Um, nothing to do with blockchain apart from the fact that, you know, they use a digital asset to, to crowdfund. Um, and it's similar to an IPO in that, you know, you're know, raising money usually on a smaller scale, but some of them, like Tezos, raised 450 million, was it? I, I get my billions and millions wrong. Some of them are very large, like EOS. Yes, a lot uh, of money. <laughs> a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> I get my series wrong there. Um, and much less so nowadays, actually. But this number of them is growing all the time. So there are like 19,000 or more different currencies, or you can call them currencies. Are they currencies? Are they commodities? Are they stocks? Well, those tokens are clearly securities, but Ether is clearly a commodity. Um, Bitcoin is supposed to be a store of value, but can it be if it's so volatile? I don't know. Um, they have features of currencies, features of commodities, and some of them also are securities, no doubt. The majority of them are securities because of the way that they've been used to raise funds. Yeah. So I also wanted to talk about the central bank-backed digital currencies. CBDCs. Yes, yeah, CBDCs, when they, uh, as they're coming through. How, does, how is that going to change the game here, if at all? Well, it'll help the risk of stable coins. That's the bottom line. At the moment, you see... Let me just start at ground zero because most people don't really understand CBDCs. Um, and the document that they put out, I thought was very clear, but it has been criticized by the public. And I do know a lot of people who are rather nervous about Big Brother being able to see every transaction that we do. So um, I would say, first of all, that we definitely need to reduce our exposure to private money because as we use our Apple Pay, and our Ding Ding, and our credit cards and so forth. More and more of our money, 85% all cash or all funds in the UK is held with private banks. And you may have heard a couple of days ago, landmark ruling Bar Barclays are not going to be paying that lady back, even though she was defrauded nearly a million. And that's a landmark case because it means lots of people like me who have also been scammed. I had a remote access scam. They gained remote control of my phone and my computer at the same time and made all these transactions. I didn't even make them. And I'm still waiting like six months to hear anything from the financial ombudsman because I won't mention the, it wasn't a bank. It was one of these many, many electronic money mm. institutions. Your money is not safe with these places. It really isn't. And yet we're relying on it because we have no alternative. But imagine that instead of, because nobody carries cash around anymore, and that's the only source of public money, which is safe. There's no credit risk. Mm. Um, and that's what a CBDC will do. That's all. They're still going to give people cash if they want it. It's a bit like pay as you go phone on your, on your car, you know. Now, over time, more and more people are just using pay as you go on your phone. But there used to be lots of people that couldn't do it, and they wanted to put money in a meter, you know, mm. and we'll carry on like that for a while. But we definitely, definitely need to have a CBDC because the alternative is that you use something else with a stable value, certainly not Bitcoin, but something called Tether um, that has a relatively stable dollar value, although it can be attacked. And stable coins have been attacked. The Terra Luna attack was a major attack on a different type of stable coin that's not really in supply anymore. Anyway, these, what they're supposed to be, uh, sort of custodial stable, stable coins like Tether. I mean, honestly, it's pretty clear that Tether was just taking people's 
fiat currency issuing tether um but um the i say okay there were intermediaries like exchanges where which act as brokers these exchanges are not just a plot platform they also act as brokers they act as custodians they do their own clearing and settlement they wipe you out on a moment's notice without a margin call etc cetera, etc cetera. they also were brokers for tether hmm. and you would give upload your fiat you try and get it off though upload your fiat swap it for tether and then trade against tether things and that was the a couple of years ago that was the only model that was used and a couple of years ago an awful lot of money was going on to these exchanges and a, a huge amount of tether was being issued i mean up to 70 billion that's gone a bit down recently maybe but um it's a huge amount of dollars that have been issued out of nowhere from a company that is completely unregulated and has all sorts of problems with the Bitfinex exchange, which was an intermediary, whatever. Problems, cowboys, bad actors the whole time. Uh, clearly, these exchanges made enough money in the end to pay back this commercial IOU, commercial paper that they gave mm. to Tether. So Tether is now phase two, fully transparent. And you look at their website and they seem to have all the reserves. And that, of course, they don't know because stable coins by the MICA, the Markets and Crypto Assets le legislation in Europe, um, USD stable coins are going to be restricted. Yeah. Great. Because Tether's taken over South America. Uh, the yeah. dollarization of South America is fairly complete with Tether. And, you know, the, the US government are quite happy with that. And they're in bed with Circle, the other US stable coin, through BlackRock. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so now Tether issuing tons of, of GBP and EUR. Um, but you see, they can be attacked, they will be attacked, and there's all sorts of regulatory problems going on with them. And it's not a long-term solution to have money supply controlled by an unregulated private company. But if the money supply of a stable thing you can use on blockchains is by a government like a CBDC, then that's the way forward. So it's definitely going to happen. Um, and people shouldn't be so scared. No, that's really interesting. But thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we'll be seeing you at Quant Minds International later in the year. And we'll probably talk to. about the regulations yeah, as well. Yeah, there. yeah. So, It'd be nice uh, to have a panel discussion or something. Oh, there you go. Talk to Afif. <laughs> oh, shall I? Yeah, I will. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Lily.